Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group. Hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury. With the best political panel in New Zealand media. Reviewing the week. Setting the agenda. Avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole. Call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group. Kia ora Aotearoa, I'm your host, the editor of the daily blog, Martin Bradbury. Hashtag socialism, hashtag solidarity, hashtag Chippy's doing his best, I suppose. QAnon, anti-vaxxer, incel, free market lunatics to the right of me, insufferably humorless, middle-class, woke, cancellation, lynch mobs to the left of me. And here I am, dear listener, stuck in the radical middle with you. This is the Working Group, New Zealand's best and greatest weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. Text WORKING to 3598 for all show updates and subscribe to our Rover, YouTube and Facebook pages to ensure that you endlessly nag your family members to watch us and tell strangers on public transport how funny we are. Joining me tonight to discuss the big issues is the greatest political panel in New Zealand broadcasting history. Our first panellist is so right wing he makes Mike Hosking look like a beardless Karl Marx who loves cycle lanes and capital gains taxes. He's an ideological peacock in a parliament of drab owls. I'd say he was the 27th most important heteronormative white says male columnist at Stuff but based on the current media environment Stuff might not exist by the time this podcast comes out. He's your friendly local free market vulture feasting on the carcass of broken dreams and failure. The libertarian liquidator. The controller of capitalism. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien, all tax is theft. Grant, kill the comrade. Welcome back to the show. I was wondering that introduction, you might have been talking about Michael Woods. But One, no, well, we'll me. get it's to good, Michael Woods. Good. Don't you worry, we'll get to him in, in just a moment. One word to describe the week, please, sir. Ambition. I think we are starting to see the extent of this government's ambition. And my two friends to the left here won't like it. But it is shaping up to be potentially a very radical uh, administration. And I'm excited at what's happened so far, and I'm looking forward to the next two and a half years. Our next panellist is nicknamed Molotov Cocktail for his militant union tactics and devil may care charm. He's magnificent at fighting for workers' interests not so great at filing his own interests for work, the former Labour Party cabinet minister and constant champion for the underdog and the lowest paid workers, Etu Union's negotiation specialist, the Honourable Michael Wood. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. Uh, one word to describe the week, please, sir. Oh, this week? Yes. Oh, it, it's been grim this week, I'm going to say, in, in, in my area of work. Yep, but, yep, um, yep. And we'll get into that in just a moment. And last, but certainly not least, he's the only reason you would pay for a Herald subscription. Militant cyclist, recreational Jedi, and ceaseless cheerleader for a better Auckland. The best columnist at the New Zealand Herald, Simon Wilson. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. Uh, one word to describe the week, please, sir. Chunky. Yep. Chunky. Well, you know, we got told about chunking things down to make things work, and, you know, um, all of us, of course, have a different meaning of the word chunky, don't we? We, we do. After a hard night out. Chunky it'll be. Uh, let's get hey, into hold this on, are you, say, are you saying Martin and I are fat? <laughs> I, I, well, <laughs> that's, that's what I <laughs> took from that. You certainly are. Uh, let's get into this evening's show. Issue one, Outrageous. is the New Zealand mainstream <laughs> media industry broken? And what does that mean for fourth estate journalism and the democracy? Issue two, Brooke Van Velden's Q&A interview and the problem of at social policy vandalism. And issue three tonight, are attempts to rule methane out a new quack science for the political right to ignore climate change? Plus, we'll also have a final word at the end of the show where each panellist can sound off to see who will breach broadcasting standards this week. My money is on Michael Wood talking about TVNZ management. Before we get into our issues though, we've got breaking news the latest Courier polling. Here we go. National down to 37.1. Labour up to 25.7. Greens up to 14.6. Act down to 7.2. New Zealand First down to 6.3. To Party Māori up to 4.6. And Chris Bishop is now more liked than Chris Luxem would suggest a cult of personality minus the personality. Um, the 100-day romper stomper right-wing jamboree 
is starting to actually fray at the edges and New Zealanders don't like this conflict, do they, Damien? Who cares? There's two and a half years to go. It is not. Uh, wow. We don't. We don't. Maybe twelve months. Maybe 12 we don't. Months. We don't have an election every three months in this country. We have an election every three years, and governments are meant to govern. And sometimes they will take. They they said they would do these things. They do these things, and if the public doesn't like it, they can vote them out in two and a half years. Simon Wilson, uh, majority of people who voted national were voting national because they wanted their house price to go up 10%. They sure as Christ weren't work, voting for these culture war revenge fantasies masquerading as social policy. Tight, turns, tight, uh, tight as turning, is it not? Well, I've got something to say that I bet is not the fir- not the last time I'll say it tonight. I agree with Damien and what he just said. Ooh. I think the government, any government that wants to reform has to do it straight away, and this government mm-hmm. is doing that. They are wearing it in the polls. Not in a big way, but they are wearing it in the polls. Luxon is clearly wearing it. Luxon is, you know, he, he does his, he goes out of his way to look like an incompetent fool, and then he comes back and does stuff, and maybe that kind of just rescues him. But he is doing... He, they. They do have a program of change and they are introducing it straight away. And that is a lesson that every government ought to learn. I just want to say also on that poll, how splendid to see the Greens at double the rate for ACT. Uh, Michael, um, the problem we have with this new government is one of the weakest uh, National Party leaders for some time caught between David Seymour and Winston Peters. And it's ripping apart any pretense of solidarity, isn't it? Look, the overall split between opposition and government in this poll is about the same as what it was at the election. So in that sense, you could say there's actually not huge movement. There's a bit of movement uh, within the blocks, but not between the blocks. The only real striking thing is the continue, continual struggle of Chris Luxon here. We're six months in. At this point, uh, Clark was still in a honeymoon period. Key was still in a honeymoon period. Ardern was certainly still in a honeymoon period. And this guy's numbers go further and further south. That is going to be a problem that builds over the term. But those, okay. but, but those governments that you refer to, they didn't actually do an awful lot. I mean, all, all of those governments were, were fairly conservative, managed from well, the centre-left or the centre-right. This this government, as you said, they're, they're doing stuff, they're breaking things, um, and that's going to well, get a reaction. I mean, I mean, Key, to be fair, did nothing for a full eight years. It was it was truly yeah. magnificent. <laughs> Helen, Helen Clark got pretty active in the last term, but she spent six years doing not much. I, I sort of hear what you're saying there, uh, but in the sense that this government has been active and has broken some plates, agree with you there. And I agree with Simon, actually, that the time you know, a government should use its capital when it's in there early. Most of it has been in the negative. Most of it has been uh, turning the clock back. It has right. been repealing. There isn't actually very much in terms of major structural change that this government has done anything for not yet. yet. Not yet. Or, or, I mean, let's see. Or signalled. Or yeah. signalled. Or, or signalled. Or signalled. There's actually, look at, look at yet, National's then. agenda and manifesto. It's actually pretty thin. No, uh, that's, 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 that's where we're that's where we're lying on the act part. Maybe that's it? right. And, and, and do all the heavy because, lifting for because them. Because na- na- national well, not. If National doesn't have a lot going if on. If National wants to govern for three years with an ACT Party agenda and then face the electorate, bring it on. Yeah, no, 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 they don't, they don't want to govern. They want to be in office, Michael. It's a very important <laughs> let's, distinction. Let's, That's let's why the kick. National Party was formed. That's right. the only reason the National Party was formed. Exactly. Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. The New Zealand media industry has been rocked by the bleeding obvious, which is that their failed rating system for legacy media were always more art than science. The New Zealand radio rating system it was a diary that you filled in every 15 minutes which no one ever filled in properly the New Zealand newspaper ratings are opinion polls and the New Zealand TV rating system is a magical 180 boxes that limits choice to whoever had the TV remote when the sales rep told the advertiser that 300,000 people would see, hear, read their advert, it was based on rating systems that were flattering but not real. With the ruthlessness of online audience measurement, advertisers can now see exactly how many people are actually seeing the adverts and the legacy media never adapted quickly enough to this new reality. What we see now is hollowed out journalism target, g- competing against against social media hate algorithms designed to generate emotional responses rather than forth the state accountability. Damien, your free market libertarian nightmare is upon us. New Zealand has never had the audience size to make advertising-based broadcasting feasible. That's why it always required the state broadcaster with no fourth estate who will hold this hard-right, racist, climate-denying, beneficiary-bashing government to account. Thoughts? 
So was 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 that a question or was this some sort of fantasy statement from the depths of your deranged mind? There was Both. No, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. There was there was no question there. We have seen the result. Part of the reason why the trust in media is lower than the ethical standards of the um I was gonna say lawyer, but that would just get me in trouble, so I won't. Um, the reason why the, the the popularity of the fourth estate is declining is people perceive it to be biased, right? They look not at, true. They, they look at people like Simon and they say, "We like Simon. He's a lovely man. He's a cyclist. He looks at very good uh, environmentally, but he's not an objective journalist." And this is the problem that the fourth estate has got. Not so. They they are no longer reporting. They have become activists, and the and the public are reacting to this. And part of the problem is the public interest journalism fund. So yes, the state can fund the media, but the more the state funds the media, the less the public trust it. So you are better off to have an underfunded, independent media than you are to have God uh, the, that, that we've got now, which is people producing opinion masquerading as journalism and the public not buying it. If you queue follow-up question, Broadcasting Minister Melissa Lee has refused to support the fair digital news bargaining bill that Willie Jackson put forward that would at least force Google and Facebook to pay for the journalism they take for free. Why, once again, are the left providing the solutions that the right are too arrogant to use? Because it's not, it, it, it is not a solution. It is absolutely not a solution. You are turning around and saying, my business model for producing wagon wheels is not working. Therefore, well, I want to go and invite the guys who are making cars and I want to tax them really hold hard on, hold to, on. Pay, to pay for there's my actually, wagon There's actually wheel. a very good conservative concept here, which is actually about paying for something that you take and use. Yeah. That, that, that's fundamentally Fair what enough. that bill is about. It's about saying that but on social fine. media, let them, plenty let of let folks open it, open it up and they're taking the content that is produced by your TV and Z, right. or whatever, and, and and it's broken the revenue stream. What you're it's simply about saying, Damien, why do you, Damien, why Damien, do you need what you're the a state? state? You should love why it. Why do you need you the state? You should love it. But no, you, you don't. Are a no, 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 please, I want to clarify. The state Sorry. doesn't do it. It sets up a bargaining framework between the digital providers and the producers of content so they come to an agreement. They are and the digital, compelled. The, they and, are compelled. Yeah, that's right. should be compelled. Instead Mike, of just being able to take the content for free. Michael, your union members are on the front line of this debate. The TVNZ and News Hub decisions were out today. Can you give us an update on where members are at? Yeah, well, what we've heard today is that TVNZ is uh, pursuing uh, the original, uh, well, their original proposals, which will see the end of... Um, uh, fair go. Yep. Um, in its current form, there'll be a there is some reprieve there, which uh, there'll be a bit of additional resource going into a digital platform yep. and a maintenance right. of the Fear Go brand. So that's that's something, and we yep. think it is a result of the public pressure in the Save Our Stories campaign. So yes. well done to everyone who who backed that. We'll hear about Sunday tomorrow, but overall there is still a massive cut in the news and current affairs capacity of TVNZ, which is is bad for our society and our democracy, particularly when it's coupled with the same likely outcome at News Hub. Uh, this week, it will mean that powerful politicians, business people and others get asked the tough questions less often and with less rigour. Um, it'll mean that um, you know uh, people have uh, one less place to go uh, with stories, one less place where significant public policy issues get debated. So it's a real issue. And But, but to come back to your original thing, we shouldn't catastrophise. There are solutions and things that we can do to help support the sector, to help it adapt, to make sure that we do mm -hmm. keep that news and current affairs content. The, the digital bargaining bill is one of them. Yep. I, I do disagree, of course I do, about public interest journalism fund. You know, um, the state um, funds the, the public education system. It doesn't make it biased. Um, not, the BBC receives public funding. It doesn't make it biased. The state has been the, funding we, the, state, the state education system, which is which is why the PISA stores continue to, to we, fall through the we, 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 The state funds things when there is a public good that the market won't provide. And there is a public good in a population which is informed, which has access to good quality uh, debate, and which the powerful get held to account that won't always be met by commercial so, so, interests. So, Simon, why do you believe the trust in media has fallen so dramatically? I've got a lot of things to say about this. It isn't because... Maybe it's a columnist, it, Damien. It is, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's right oh, he's there! Good. He's Simon good. Simon is right there! Don't be so mean! The, Some the, people the first, like Simon. Okay, the first thing I want to say about it is that I work for a pluralist newspaper. And we are all very proud to work for a pluralist newspaper at the Herald. And what that means is that when it comes to opinion, we carry a range of 
points of view. What you're saying, and stuff stuff is not a pluralist. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. But you're suggesting that the reason that the trust in media has declined is people like me. In other words, left wing columnists are destroying no, media. That's left wing let journalists. Let me not finish. Columnists. That is that's an appallingly silly idea. That is the first point. My organisation carries a range of views, and when people say to me, "Look, I love what you do, but I'm not so sure about the Herald." What I always want to say is the Herald carries different points of view mm. and that's where you should go for different points of view because it's a vigorous conversation and that's going on in the Herald. And I'm proud of that. The next and much more substantial point is that the reason that media is in crisis now is for several reasons, but the main one is advertising dollars. Advertising dollars have fled from the newspapers. They've gone online, but they haven't gone to the media companies online. Most mm. of the money, I'm mm. talking 80% of the advertising income in media now, is going to companies offshore, the biggest companies in the world, who are not paying taxes. I haven't finished. Yeah, yeah. And that is a real existential challenge that is very hard to know what to do about. The Labor government proposed something, as Michael says, a framework to force those companies yep. to the table to negotiate something fairer and more decent for the social good. And that is incredibly valuable and needed right now. The next thing is we have a, a whole generational change happening in the way people right. consume media. Yep. Young people especially are looking at short videos. Short yep. videos are really, really hot, and it is very hard to make short videos, and I'm talking five, six, seven seconds here, that give you the content of news and information that you might want the citizens of the country to have. Very hard, but that is a real sea change we're combating, and all the mainstream media are struggling to know what to do about right. these things. The money, the way in which people are uh, getting their entertainment and information, we are still working it out globally. We are still working it out. It so isn't obvious what to Simon, do. Simon, no, 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 no. Um, but, but my question was, why, according to the AUT poll, has trust in media declined? So you, you outlined a number of issues, but my question was, why does the public? Why is the public recording ever lower degree of trust in the fourth estate? Okay, I've got I've got a couple of answers to it. One is that I think you have to remember trust is down everywhere. We are a less trusting society yeah. now about almost everything, and it is tragic. It makes us quicker to anger, quicker to frustration, quicker to turn our backs, and you see that in the way people drive. You see that in the way people converse. You so nothing, that, nothing so you to see do that with in the, the way themselves. you keep interrupting and shouting at me, and you see that everywhere. Where, and it is also happening in media. It also has something to do with media. People are struggling to know how to relate to the media they're getting. And part of the way in which we in the media are struggling to know how to respond is as you lose eyeballs, as you lose readers, as you lose listeners, you go, well, maybe we should do it this way. Maybe we should do it this way. And some of those things are good and some of those things don't work. And it is a difficult time for everybody. And on top of all that... Um, there is also the question of a tipping point, which is that there's been so much noise from you and your ridiculous far-right mates, who may not be mates, but your guys, who go on and on and on about how the media has destroyed its credibility, and that has been corrosive. Simon, so Instagram... It's, so, Instagram. It's, so it's the fault of... Yep, you. Who? Who? Particularly. Well, I'll, so, I'll, I'll have, I've got a list so, of people to blame in a second. So, oh, on Instagram. So you can't. So, so your your response to my question: Why has the trust in media declined? And your and your answers were twofold. One, there is a decline of trust overall in society, and two, it is the fault of, of uh, nefarious external forces yes, on the right correct. that that's is correct. driving it. That's correct. So there yes. has there is there has been no fault. Inside the organization itself, there is nothing that the media has done that has brought this upon themselves. That is a remarkable I could, I could claim. See, I could see you were listening closely, but you did manage to miss the second thing I said between the Sorry. first and the third. And the second thing was that we are now trying to do different things to work out how to make this environment we work in, how to manage it responsibly and how to get things working. So we're commercially viable and we continue to do the core job. Simon. Again. And we uh, are getting some things right, some things wrong, and some of the things we get wrong do affect our credibility. Si but it's a process. Instagram, Simon, this year switched on a new filter to smother political debate and we know actual journalism has been smothered by the social media algorithms. Do you think that most people who get their information from their social media feeds understand that they aren't seeing the most important journalism, 
but are in fact seeing the most inflammatory rhetoric to keep people outrage addicted to doom scrolling. Do, do you think they understand that that's the process they're locked into? I don't know what people understand. I, um, I think probably lots of people uh, have a better understanding of it than you might think. Um, but that is a case that that is what's happening. Um, I also know that for people who do consume mainstream media, I mean, people tell me all the time, I was at a, 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 talking, at a talk this morning with a whole lot of retired people talking about a project I was working on. And, the, you know, what they say is, I read you this morning, your column this morning, and I agree with you or I didn't agree with you, or I sometimes agree with you, but I do read you. And that's kind of fantastic. People understanding what the media is for. You don't have to agree, but you want to find something that's worth engaging your mind over. Damien. We will give you that. Damien, when Winston does his big lie, his big lie, that the entire mainstream media were bribed because of a funding note, a funding note by New Zealand on air in regards to coverage of Māori issues for the Public Interest Journalism Fund, which, by the way was quickly clarified by New Zealand on air as not an editorial demand, when Winston conflates and maliciously spins that as a bribe, does New Zealand democracy suffer? A condition of accepting public interest journalism fund was a commitment to the Treaty of Waitangi. And that, it was a funding that note. Was, it was a funding was, note. I've written, I've written mm, extensively on this issue it many was, times. Uh, it, was, it was a condition. A funding note. It was a condition of taking the money. And For the one, Māori broadcasting. And the, and the issue is... Was quickly clarified. The issue is that the public interest journalism it, fund published or funded a lot of stuff that was not public interest journalism it was opinion opinion based reporting if i can if that uh, makes any sense and as a and part of the issue was My, can that the public the that the public have seen that money and rightly or wrongly right. they have come to the conclusion that the media were tainted by the taking yeah, of... Do you think but Winston's lie on that is helping, though? Can we no, talk, can but, we? But, I, but, I, but, but the reason why Win, what Winston says uh, resonates is because there is an element of truth to it. If Winston goes around there and says the moon is made of cheese, it would have no impact. Winston is, <laughs> Winston, Winston, is, Winston is playing to the gallery with effect because there is an element of truth to what he's saying. Can we just actually talk about some of the things that the Public Interest yes. Journalism Fund actually did? Because exactly. you haven't done that so far. One of the main gaps that it filled was making sure that actually people in provincial and regional New Zealand where coverage of news issues had completely dried up, had some local capacity. One of the other main things it did was make sure that there were actually people that could report on local government affairs. Remember, we used to have the local newspapers, the Central Leader, the Eastern Courier, etc., and there'd be somebody to the local, local government. Local people. TV news. That ended about five years ago because of the direction of the media. That's the kind of stuff that the Provincial uh, uh, journal, uh, the Journalism Fund actually did. And I'm sorry, but that's the kind of stuff, if you actually want to have a democracy that functions and people actually know what's going on and, and can engage, that's the huge gap that we've got and that you do not have a functioning, you do not, when, when the media is funded by the state, Michael, even oh, if it nonsense. is funded, even if it is funded with the best of intentions, the public lose confidence in the, it. Let's, public, let's, 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 let's the just public, it TVNZ does not and RNZ have been the highest confidence rating media organisations for and, decades and, and, and in And in the country. survey that we're basing this discussion off, do you, is, know, which the the one? Do you know which, which the network was that actually uh, was believed by people to have the biggest bias in one direction? It was News Talk ZB. Yeah. Michael, yeah. TVNZ but, has uh, always come across like a bugger's muddle. It aspires to be BBC public broadcasting, yet has the commercial imperatives of any Crown-owned enterprise. If... Labour had merged TVNZ and Radio New Zealand and made TVNZ one commercial free so that the advertising revenue could cross over to News Hub, it would have rebuilt the importance of public broadcasting while actually regulating the broken free market. When will we get a Labour Party that actually gives a shit about public broadcasting rather than pays lip service to it? Well, you're right about the essential problem, which is that the, the structure and the legislation requires TVNZ right? to be neither one thing nor the other. And that does make it very difficult. Uh, for the company, um, it should be structured, in my view, more clearly and transparently as a public interest uh, broadcaster right. with an appropriate funding stream to suit, as they have in Australia, as they have in the United Kingdom. And actually, those are highly trusted, 
highly trusted public broadcasters in those countries that people go to and have broad confidence in um, as a basic source of truth that whether you have this view or that view, you can argue over the facts. And, and, and that's what we need in New Zealand. Simon, if lonely, isolated and alienated Kiwis get their news from social media hate algorithms and they believe a shadowy one-world child-molesting satanic worshipping cabal created the COVID virus and used 5G technology to weaken our immune systems, if people are believing in demented realities, how do we win the back? How, how can the news media win those people back? I think one of the critical things that has to happen there is that it's all very well for people like me and actually people like Michael, who are no, Michael's Labour, I'm on the left, to, to be trying to explain what actually is happening. It needs people like Damien to be doing it as well. It needs people like Christopher Luxon to be doing it as well. It needs people in the middle, people on the right, who are actually sensible, giving you the credit here, to be speaking up to be speaking up all the time against the ludicrous things that we hear that get so much air time. Yeah, yeah. That's really important. It's not the voices simply on the left that have to do it. It is everybody who has a platform has to be able to say this is sensible, this is not. And this is really important for us. We, uh, the, uh, media is so important in, in a democracy and if you think about it, not just it's the, the local news that Michael talked about before, the information that we provide the entertainment, the clash of opinions you know, the ability to create social cohesion and even though people say okay it's harder now and it is harder now Media does have that capacity to create social cohesion in a way that few other institutions in our society do. And if the alternative is frothing at the mouth, ranting extreme radio, then that's just or extreme social media. That's that's an appalling prospect. Quick round. Uh, Reality Check Radio has become the latest media company to employ by today going off air. They are a lunatic fringe anti-vax conspiracy theory media station with Peter Wilson, Chantel Baker, Paul Brennan, Rodney Hyde and Cameron Slater. Surely Reality Check Radio Collapsing tells us there is a God. Damien, it's the market at work. Yes, and, and, and that, is, that is the difference because this is an organisation that went out to the market and tried to survive on its own and because it didn't get state funding it died and there are an awful lot of other organisations and I won't mention the spin-off because that would be mean organisations that without vast amounts of state funding would have died Reality Check Radio is how the market deals out with dishonest actors and the Public Interest Journalism Fund rewards them just, Reality Check I, Radio I, I, is I, gone yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think that's a good thing yes. I, I really do think yeah. it's a good thing because their commitment to the truth their commitment to, to seeking objective facts has been kind of low, uh, uh, low uh, uh, to zero uh, 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 but I just want to challenge what you said about the spin-off there I can't speak for the spin-off and I don't know very much about their funding arrangements at all I do know they have $6 million had, dollars of government money they have had some contracts to do things but their core business is funded by private sponsors uh, and that's how they operate Michael, this is the, the, the market working working, working well, properly, is it? If I could just, just offer of one, mod, one moderate comment that? at the outset just to break the tone of the entire <laughs> This is the wrong podcast for that, Michael. Yeah, that is, Actually, that is well, I mean, the, 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 the people fronting that show were fucking dangerous lunatics. Oh, oh, but but there are people behind the scenes who have lost their jobs uh, in this, sure. and that, that sucks for them, and, yep. I, and, and I feel for them whenever any company like this, right. this falls over. But can I just? this is a really important yeah, point yeah. in the context of, of the rest of it. Damien, you, yeah, your view is that whenever there's state funding coming into a media outlet, it, it taints everything that's done. There's nothing inherently different or pure um, about funding that, uh, funding that comes from particular private sources with a particular motivation in the world going to a media outlet either. Rupert Murdoch, you know, the rich exactly. folks who have been funding these new pop-up right-wing media outlets, they've got a right to be there. I'm not saying they don't. But there's nothing about the way in which they are funded and, and therefore the content that they produce that is more holy and pure than content that is produced by an outlet that comes from uh, so, has some support from the public sector. That is true. So hold on. So yep. so so you are saying that your crit your criticism your comments about the the Murdoch media I'll pick up on that. You are saying that the where the organisation gets its funding from 
is a relevant consideration, which is exactly what I've been saying about the public interest journalism. Tom. So, uh, we, it, so we agree. And I, and I, no, well, correct. actually, I think what you'll find in, 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 in all of these jurisdictions is that there tend to actually be far greater controls because of the political sensitivity and oversight there is in terms of editorial independence when there is public uh, uh, money that uh, is provided uh, than there is when you have an outfit that's funded by someone like We Murdoch. have to move on, comrades, to issue two. Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety, Brooke Van Velden's Q&A interview over the weekend saw the minister scramble to explain why New Zealand has such a high worker death rate. New Zealand is supposed to have 10 worker safety inspectors per 100,000 workers. We have six per 100,000. Australia has 11 per 100,000. Our worker death rate is far higher than Australia, yet this government are hell-bent on cutting jobs at MB. Michael, Minister Brooke Van Velden says she's not sure if more inspectors will save all the workers she claims she wants to protect. How credible is that position? Oh, look, look, it, it's not credible. The health and safety framework that we currently have was put together in the wake of the Pike River right. tragedy, the massive regulatory failings there, a royal commission. It was actually put together under a national government. Simon Bridges was the minister uh, at the time. Uh, and its recommendations included, included a substantial lift in terms of inspectorate uh, capacity. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've got Brooke Branvelden uh, running in with a you know, sort of a um, you know, student union style ideological project in an area where people's lives are literally on the line. We kill people in our workplaces at four times the rate of the United Kingdom. Right. We actually have made decent progress since Pike. We have yes. actually reduced the rates of deaths and serious injuries. But that's because but, the inspectors went up yeah. to eight. They've gone down to six now. Yep, so there right. was that peak, right? Yep, and it right. worked. And this is the issue yeah, right across the sector. Same, you know, I've heard uh, government ministers this week talking about migrant exploitation. Well, at exactly the same time, they're forcing MB to cut its workforce. And you know who's an MB? The Labour inspector, the right. people who keep a check on migrant exploitation. Follow-up question. 44 New Zealanders died at work last year. This is 2024. Every Kiwi deserves to know their family member is coming back alive at the end of the bloody workday. Why do we continue to have one of the worst worker safety rates in the Western world? Yeah, uh, look, a range of a range of reasons is that there's you know, a degree of complacency still. What what we saw after Pike and the regulatory change and just the focus was quite a significant improvement in, in the rates and the behaviours. And then over time, you get complacency that slips into the system. Um, we've still got, we're still, we're still in the early days, for example, of directors having some responsibilities. Only last year we had the first prosecution under the Act of a director when yeah. there had been a de the death of a worker. We've actually got to start to embed that kind of responsibility across the system as well. And I've got to say, if Brooke Branvelden really wants to take this, uh, take this on, she's going to face 400,000 union members, she's going to face the Pike families, and she's going to face everyone who suffered a workplace tragedy determined to stop any watering down of this area. Simon, the problem for ACT is that they are automatically intellectually hostile to any state involvement and indeed see any state regulation as the problem. Mm -hmm. Can can a fringe far-right party add constructively to policy if their starting point is amputation? I think one of the most extraordinary things about that interview that Jack Tame did on Q&A with Brooke Van Velden is that from the first question, she defined the problem in her portfolio, workplace relations, as being red tape, yeah, which is just a nonsensical thing to say. Yeah, when you think about the things that Michael has just said about how out of whack we are. We have a really big problem in this country which is that we have a kind of Wild West attitude to violence and death. She'll be right. And you see it, yeah, you see it in domestic violence. You see it on the road in our, our, our deaths and serious injuries, which are far higher than comparable countries yeah. like ours. Yeah. And you see it in workplace relations. And there are other ways in which you see it. And we think, <coughs> yes, we think she'll be right. We think this is the norm. We think it's okay. We think it's what civilized societies are. And it isn't. We are an outlier. And we have a really fundamental issue that we have to face up to. Follow-up question. Let's be honest about what this really amounts to. An attack on unions with a view to allow employers to stop paying union fees from wages. This has nothing to do with worker safety and everything to do with cutting off a revenue source for the unions, isn't it? I think that's absolutely right. We... Um, we saw under the uh, national government in the 90s a serious attack on unions. That sort of came back a bit with John Key, but it was not nothing like it was under the 90s, and it's coming back again. Unions are, used to be, 
the bulwark for decency in a society. The unions were the, were the organisations that ensured that employers didn't get away with things that are just appalling and reprehensible. I'm not talking about all employees, of course, all employers, of course, but that's what the unions did. The unions helped organise organised people so they could work together to get decent living standards to get safety and other Damien, things. Okay, you argue, hold on, Damien, hold on, hold on. And, and, and unions I, are in the way of any libertarian government, what? influence government. Simon, that want, but no. it's not just ACT. The things I said before, domestic violence and transport and so on, Simeon Brown National Party, the, there is an overlap in the in the ideology there. It's not just ACT. Hold on. No, sorry, Martin. Um, uh, Simon, I want to pick you up on that. How do you feel a libertarian would respond to unions? What do you think our instinctive reaction to a union would be? I'm a well, libertarian. What do you think? I, how do I'm, you suspect? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting you wrong here, but I did assume that somebody who believed that there should not be uh, communal rights, uh, which would be a libertarian position. Um, okay, you're shaking your head, and I'm no. very, very so pleased me, to hear it. Let me, you can let tell me, me why you're a friend of the working man and a friend I'm of the a, unions. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a friend of the working man at all, but I believe <laughs> unions, unions are a voluntary association, and I have absolutely no problem with any voluntary association, whether it be a union, whether it be a church, whether it be an, a, an institution or even a cartel. If a, if a group of people wish to organise themselves in a voluntary way in order to improve their own benefits, even though it may be detrimental to society, then I am completely in support of that. And that is not, you are confusing libertarians with conservatives, sir. Can I just come back to, to, to both of you? Why do you think we have such a high level of death and injury in our workplace relative to comparable countries? Why do you think that is? One of the, the, the issues is a fragmented labour market in which people, workers particularly, okay, often thanks. have limited power and agency. So think about one of the sectors that's been highlighted in recent years, and that is forestry. Mm. Now, most of those guys in places like the East, Co- East Coast who ended up being killed out there were in small, contractor-led crews out in the bush, okay, no right. union capacity or, or wanna, coverage. Just, or just wanna, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not attacking you. I'm just, I am describing. No, no, no. This is the answer. No, it's, one, is, it's, one, it's one of the answers. It's a it's complex one of the question. Simon, Simon, why, no. do you, why, why do you think we have? Because I know what the answer is, and it's going to appall both of you. But Simon, what do you think the answer I is? I think it's what um, what Michael just said. Small, fragmented workforces, often non-unionized, okay. with no no recognition or no ability to go. Hang on, we can prevent this. And okay. that's part of it. And so the other part of it is get, that Wild West you, culture I mentioned let me tell before you, Let me tell you what the, answer, what the answer actually is. There is absolutely no economic cost to a business in this country if you maim, kill or injure your workers. Yeah. We have an accident compensation regime that means if I as an employer, if my staff die or are injured or are killed, I suffer no economic consequences. The chances of WorkSafe um, actually prosecuting me are next to zero. Like all government departments, they are incompetent well, and useless. And you can, you, can, you can man them up as much as you like. They're not going to have anywhere near the effect. If I have a situation where I as an employer am reckless and somebody is injured or dies in my workplace, my insurance premiums will go up, I should be sued. That is what happens in a well, rational country. Yep. We don't do that in New Zealand. In well, New Zealand, we have we have a form of social contract which says to employers like me, hey, Damien, we want to make sure that you make a profit. And if your recklessness results in the death and injury of your staff, that doesn't matter because you I, will not suffer an economic look, consequence. I'd, I'd say, ACC is an abomination and we are paying to increase the uh, profits of employers uh, at the end. Expense, at the expense of the okay. health and safety okay. of the workers. These are your clients. These are hey, your workers. Let me say, let me, let me say a couple of things. An abomination, let me say a couple of things. I don't understand one, why the one, is, is one, is that, one is that clearer financial penalties in this case uh, uh, do have a role to play. Yeah. So it was the Health and Safety at Work Act, as I said before, that introduced liability for directors so they can be held financially to account. That is one of the things that Brooke is signalling she wants to get rid of so in her affirm of health and safety. Wrong. Secondly, I would like to think that some of the business owners of New Zealand, I do think this, might be motivated by more than just avoiding a fine when and it comes yet, to ensuring their workers aren't killed. See, do you think that might see, be a good thing? Thirdly, do you support so. corporate manslaughter? 
given oh. what you've just said. I support, oh, we, sh- we should have you do, corporate Damien. manslaughter Sounds as a criminal like offence in I New would, Zealand to ensure there is accountability I for people who do that. I right, have, I okay. Have given that, I, have ah. given that, I have given that no thought, so I, um, okay. I, don't, I don't want to give it... Quick, a, quick a, round, quick round. Down, but no, 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 I mean, I just want to come back to the point that, as you have both identified, we have a systemically higher rate of death and injury in our workforce than comparable countries. And the one big difference between us and the comparable countries is the ACC regime. And and any objective you can put, the, the, we've had ACC for now three or four decades, and the end result is that we are killing and maiming and injuring our employees to ensure that the profitability of our low productive country is maintained. Quick round, quick round, quick round. Can, we, can round. we just say that health and safety regulations in this country are supposed to make it really difficult for companies and, and be and penalise companies that break them. The fact that those regulations well, have not been enforced to the degree that it should be uh, is not the fault of the fact that there are regulations. Quick round, quick round. Deunionisation of workers is the legacy of neoliberal reforms and has seen our wages erode and work safety worsen. Is it time, gentlemen, for compulsory unionism to make a comeback in New Zealand? Damien. <laughs> the key word is compulsory. If you want to join a union, then... Um, as Mark, Mark Wood is out there and yep. he is demonstrating what a union can do for its workers yes. and in the free Preach, market brother. people will say yes I like what Michael Wood is doing and I will sign that to the you, union or Simon, they won't. Simon Universal? I think union uh, unionism should be compulsory. Amen. I absolutely do think that. Amen. I, I don't know how you make that happen no, because yes. you need a social you need a social licence to do it, but I do think it should be the case. Well, uh, surpri- surely, su- surely. Surprise answer of the night, no. Uh, compulsory unionism okay. did, did make unions weak and flab- weak and flabby when it was put in place and vulnerable when there was there was a change to the legislation would in 1991. You, but, you need, but, but you do need to have a framework in which unions can effectively and efficiently organise and represent people. That is one of the key things about fair pay agreements. It yes. gave unions the ability to connect with people and actually bargain in a way that was sustainable for them. We don't have that at the moment. Would uh, universal membership, uh, union membership of migrant workers who are coming into I, the country and who are, who are being exploited at an unbelievable rate in this country. I, I think there is, a, there is a strong case given the particular vulnerability right. of migrant workers for there to be a much stronger degree of union involvement at the outset Amen. when they come into New Zealand yes. to ensure that protection is there. Comrades, we must move on to issue three. The government has announced a nonsense independent panel to review methane gas emission targets. When the government says independent panel they mean a bunch of agro business goons with self-interested views to keep methane out of the emissions target simon uh they are trying to redefine methane gas as not a problem because it dissipates in eight years but the problem is that methane is 28 times more potent than co2 so while the methane does dissipate and isn't a permanent gas, producing it creates heat spikes that allows for abnormalities within the biosphere to exponentially explode, causing enormous disruption to the lives of mil- billions. Isn't trying to pretend methane isn't a climate changing gas just quack science for climate deniers? I think it is, and I think the motives of the government setting up an independent so called expert panel to provide contesting advice against the Climate Change Commission are spurious in the way you outline. We don't know that, but it does seem likely. The thing about methane is that when you say 28 times more potent, uh, that's one of the conservative estimates on it. The thing about methane is that although it's short-lived in the atmosphere, mm-hmm. it's so much more damaging. We need, in the next few years, when we used to talk about 10 years till the end of the decade, it's only six years to the end of the decade now, we need, in the next few years, to be, f- as a as a planet, globally reducing our emissions fast. Methane offers offers a way to do that, and that is why the COP conferences have focused on methane because there is globally an appalling wastage, seepage of methane gas from pipelines and from refineries. So they focused there. They haven't focused on the agricultural side of the biogenic methane. Yeah, but that's where we can play our part. So rather than saying methane is something that because it's short-lived, therefore isn't as big a problem, actually, if the, if the planet could really get a grip on methane emissions, we would be able to do a whole lot of very substantial work to reduce emissions quickly, and that would be so valuable. Damien, heat records are currently off the charts, and scientists fear we've inadvertently triggered biosphere tipping points. 
how will ignoring methane help battle climate change? I just want to acknowledge the fact that the, the minister responsible is Simon Watts, and I, I can't think of a better nominative determinism. And that also indicates where, where his thinking is on this, on this issue. We need the Watts. We need kilowatts, Simon. Uh, no, look. The, Wind kilowatts. The problem, <laughs> the, pro, the problem is that at some point there is a trade-off between methane and food. And I, and I quite like food. Um, so I'm not into, you know, the, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, we're going we're gonna to cull the cows. We're going to inject the cows with something to reduce the amount of methane. It's, it's a nonsense. And the, and the other reality yeah, is that New Zealand is one of the most carbon efficient uh, producers of well, beef that there is. Well, maybe so, put your resources into trying to find those scientific solutions instead of an idiotic anti-science sop, which is all that this is. Are you referring to you referring to the, <laughs> you uh, the clim- clim- you. climate climate change commission because no, I no, mean no. climate come on the climate no, no, that, that, change no, that piece of work that, that that Martin's just mentioned my but, Michael, Michael, is, but no 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 I'm, no, I'm acknowledging no, no. part what you said which is you have to find some solutions but but, that, but the Simon and, White's report isn't back so before we dismiss it we should at least read it to be fair and and look I don't, I know almost next to nothing about methane other than the fact that I generate a fair amount of it myself. And I don't. I there was Shall just there was just the the whole climate change hysteria thing. Um, uh, the the oh. solution the solution is to t- put a price on the things that you don't want. So no, if if, no. if methane <laughs> if methane is a problem, if carbon is a problem, you just put a price on it and yeah. you allow the market to resolve it. And so if you want to reduce the amount of methane, put a cost on well, the that, amount of methane. That, that was what we were doing. It. it was going to come in in 2025. And, and that's one of the things that the, this government has, has yeah, stopped doing, along true. with every other single... Pra- let, let's not be catastrophic about it. Let's look at the practical things we can actually do. Price methane in agriculture, uh, encourage and incentivise cleaner vehicles, have more public no, no, transport. No, no. Every single one, one of those things has gone backwards under this no, law. But, but, and but, but, Damon, you, had, you just had your turn. There is another substantial problem with... There is another substantial problem with what you just said in relation to pricing it. We live in a country where it is incredibly difficult to price methane because there is a strong attachment to the idea that we should not reduce our uh, cattle numbers. Cattle yeah. numbers, yeah, 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 yeah which yeah. is something, of course. Every that, cow you know, is precious. Every cow is precious, which is a nonsense, and every, every farmer will tell you is a nonsense. Precious. They do go to the abattoir. Yeah, at some point, it does happen. Don't so, tell Damien. Uh, it is very, it is very hard to price methane. So there's a constant battle in this debate we're having now as a part of it. It is very hard to price carbon because there is enormous consumer resistance to raising the price of petrol. And not just because of petrol, but you raise the price of petrol, you raise the price of everything else. So governments have to work extremely hard and be extremely committed to do two things. One, to create the social license to do those things. And two, to find other things that will happen. And Michael just touched on them. Michael, You've opening, got to have alternatives. Michael, it's not just pretending methane isn't a climate change gas. We're also seeing transnational mining interests push ahead of the environment with new fast track powers. Is Shane Jones really the best person to be approving these far reaching decisions on climate change? Uncle Shane, is Uncle Shane the, the best person? Dr. Pork, really? <laughs> you know, th- these changes actually go beyond the powers that Muldoon had. Right. What they actually do, so we had a fast track process under the previous government. There is a need to be able to more efficiently process important infrastructure. If a panel of experts tell you that, right? Yeah, that's right. But the the particular thing that, that goes beyond with this piece of legislation, it gives individual ministers the ability to override and ignore other Experts. pieces of statute, the yes. Wildlife Act and the Conservation Act, for example, yeah, by fiat, yeah. by fiat. You know, individual ministers a can do that. should be concerned about that. Um, th- this, is, this is deeply, deeply concerning. If they really think that those acts are a problem, then bring them to Parliament and change them. That, that, that's what you do in a democracy. Yeah. You, you, you don't load up your ministers with Henry VIII powers. Quick round, should um, young... And, and open up the risk of vested interests as quick, well. As quick you round, debate. should young people have been protesting last week about climate change, or was David Seymour right to demand all truant children be whipped in public? Damien. Well, given how catastrophically useless the public education system is, I'm not just too, <laughs> too sure that taking a day off would do them any harm whatsoever. Uh, so I, I think mean, we are extraordinary. You think about um, Greta Thunberg. 
who every Friday was out there protesting. Right. We are extraordinarily lucky in this country and in the world that school kids are not rioting in the streets. Yep. The fact that they take the occasional day off to march peacefully is the least the least we could expect, and we should support them to do a whole Amen. lot more. Amen. Preach. I, I agree. Look, if it was every week or every month, he'd have a point, but it's not. <laughs> right. it, it's, a, it's, it's the biggest issue that this generation faces, Com- and it's, it's absolutely fair cop. Comrades, we need a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor is Gravity Credit Management, and I was chatting to Andrew Kingston last week, and he was just running through one of the issues that he faces is information. So somebody owes you money and they disappear off into the uh, ether and you don't always have the, the contact details. One of the things that Gravity Credit is very good at is tracking people down. If somebody owes you money and they've done a, done a runner, Gravity Credit may well be able to locate them and engage with them. If you have customers who owe you money, big or small, commercial or domestic, Give Andrew Kingston a call on 0800 Gravity or go to gravitycredit.co.nz and he'll be delighted to help you. Comrades, we must wrap the show with a final word. Damien Grant, your final word this week, please, sir. Uh, I spent last week at a, a, an absolutely awesome uh, Atlas event in Queenstown. You will be uh, delighted to know Martin at the New Zealand Initiative. And if, if I could just bottle the... There's a, there's a massive disconnect, I think, between what people think goes on at these vast right-wing conspiracy events and what actually goes on. And so we heard from a number of ministers and, and other people in a similar space, and one of the things that... Now, it's possible that these ministers are all lying, of course, and they're all cheating and, and trying to, to trick us, but the things that they were saying and the things that concerned them was the fact that the education system is failing the, uh, the poor and the vulnerable. The social welfare system is not delivering sustainable uh, results where we have at some point people on, on welfare for you know, one and sometimes even over two decades. There was, there was a billionaire who stood out there and pushed really hard urging other members in the organisation to uh, employ more uh, Maori and Pacifica and pushing very hard his books and homes programs. One of the things that I, and I belong to the initiative and I'm giving them a, a shout out for other businesses who are considering getting involved, this is an organisation that is that is focused on doing something good for New Zealand. And you may not always agree with what they, what they, how they go about doing it, but these, this is an excellent organisation, and um, and I'm proud to belong to it, and uh, all power to it. Uh, Michael, your final word this week, please, sir. Oh, well, my sources tell me that the break fee that Hyundai is likely to put on the New Zealand government for stupidly cancelling the inter island vessels could be around about two hundred million dollars. Oh! And so, what we're going to get due to the. Um, financial wizardry of Nicola Willis, Chris Bishop and Simeon Brown um, is a two, potentially a $200 million break fee. Um, a government that's going to have to go and purchase new ferries uh, that will cost more than the ferries that were oh purchased through a oh fixed price contract back in 2019 oh. that will have lower capacity and that will arrive several years later while we have to do, make do with ferries across State Highway 1 between our North and South, South Island that become increasingly uh, unreliable. So National Party, uh, the party and the government of fiscal responsibility and wise and prudent decision making, there you go. Oh, yeah, but shit. They're economic decisions. They're so, economic managers. They're so, better at it. You Simon, you, you heard that here first. That's news <laughs> right here first. Simon, your final word this week. My please, final sir. words. I want to give um, some kudos to Christopher Luxon for introducing tar- 2030 targets. I think it is a splendid idea for a government to have medium term targets to announce them and to announce what's more that they're going to track them and monitor and tell us about how they're progressing towards them. I really look forward to the way in which uh, we're told, or what, how we're told how they're going to reach these targets so that they're not just apple pie lo- lovely things like we're going to abolish crime or reduce crime and so on. Having said that where is the target to reduce family harm? Where is the target to reduce poverty? Where's the target to build more social housing? Where's the, the target to reduce illnesses of poverty? Where's the target to do something about transport? Where are the targets that will make Auckland a functional city? Where are the targets to build the tech economy? Where is the vision for what this country might be by 2030? None of that 
is there. And before um, Martin wraps up for the show, we would just like to thank both of our guests, Michael Wood and Simon Wilson. If you like what Michael Wood has got to say, you can catch him. I see you're still posting on X, so that's Michael Wood NZ. Uh, if you like what Simon Wilson has had to say, you can catch him at the New Zealand Herald. You will need a subscription, and, and as you should, uh, you can follow Simon on X at Simon B. Wilson. Martin, take it away. Thank you, comrades. My final word this week. David Seymour is quickly finding the issue of truancy is far more complex than just getting out the belt for a whipping. Reaction in New Zealand is screaming for him to find the parents of truant children, but the ramifications of a Puritan approach is a burning bridge too far even for Seymour. Taking food out of hungry kids' mouths he's fine with. Paying for a truancy stasi is a cost too great for someone focused only on amputation. So, after looking at the stats, it's sickness that has kept kids home. This should surprise no one. Post-COVID, we have all had weakened immune systems, and the plague of sickness that has swamped us has resulted in far more kids staying at home. The reality Seymour faces here is that the enormous true level of poverty in wider society is first harvested, at primary school, forcing parents to send their sick kids to school so truancy rates fall while removing free food from those very same schools is going to be fun to watch. The right know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Now here's Tom with the weather. That was the Working Group New Zealand's number one weekly political podcast that is not funded by New Zealand On Air. Remember, text WORKING to 3598 for all show updates and follow us on Rover, YouTube and Facebook. We'll see you Tuesday next Next week when Labour Party MP Arena Williams and New Zealand's answer to Noam Chomsky, Max Harris, are our guests. Kia ora and ka pai. You stay classy, <laughs> Aotearoa. <Don't help> Hooray! <laughs> Weekly political podcast, The Working Group. Not one minute of this show was funded by New Zealand On Air. No, no creamy public broadcasting money for us. That was The Working Group.